We are uh, continuing today on our Jesus Rock sermon series. If you did not pick up a rock on your way in, raise your hand and, and keep it up. Alex is back there, up here in the front. Alex is back there to, to help you out and get you fixed up. All right, we're going to open up today with our scripture reading, and it's not going to be on the screens. It's a little longer, so you need to listen. Or if you have your Bibles and you want to open them up to it, I'm in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verses 37 to 52. 37 to 52. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisee, Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked grave, graves, which men walk over without knowing it. And one of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us. Jesus replied, And you, experts of the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in His wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. Who in the world did these scribes and Pharisees think they were? They were religious men of the first century Judaism who continually confronted Jesus with justice and law. We see them all throughout the New Testament. Who did they really think they were? I think they, they can simply be described this way. They believed in traditions. They believed in rituals. And they created as many of them and trusted in them as they did the Word of God. They believed others should strictly adhere to the law, but they didn't have to. The Pharisees were religious priests who very carefully observed every aspect of Jewish law. If the law called for a fast, they began their fast early and they stayed late. If the law called for a tithe, they gave a tithe and an offering. And everybody knew it. You see, that was another characteristic of the Pharisees. They portrayed themselves as better than the regular folks. In fact, their name even suggests it. The name Pharisee means men who separated themselves. Because they refused to associate with sinners around them to the point where some of them actually attached blinders to the side of their heads to help from seeing any more of the sinners than they had to. This was the religious elite. These were the gatekeepers. The scribes were associated with the Pharisees. They were kind of the lawyers and legal counsels of the day. They were experts on Jewish law. They determined how the law should be observed and how it can be avoided. They even crafted escape clauses that enabled them to do work on the Sabbath. 
For example, the law, Jewish law, to carry a burden is forbidden. Jewish law accepted. He who carries anything, whether it be in his right hand or in his left hand or in his bosom or on his shoulder, is guilty. Pretty clear, right? And that tells you what you can't do. So, the scribes came up with this. They said, but he who carries anything on the back of his hand or with his foot or with his mouth or with his elbow or with his ear or with his hair or with his money bag turned upside down or between his money bag and his shirt or in the fold of his shirt or in his shoe or in his sandal is not guilty because he didn't carry it in the usual way of carrying. <laughs> well, I think I see the first thing that comes to my mind. Have you ever said to your kids, you know what I meant? Right? We've said that when they're like doing something that we told them they can't, but we didn't specifically say it that way. You know, it's like, you know what I meant. And I'm thinking, that's the same, you know, come on. You know what we meant. But that's what they did. That's what they did. They used the law to turn things around. The way the Pharisees and the scribes observed and avoided the law. And they, were con and they condemned anyone who didn't do it their way. And this all was done in the name of religion. This is all done in the name of being faithful. Condemn anyone who didn't do it their way. That's what scribes and Pharisees did. It had to be their way. So then one day comes this Jesus guy. Now, i got a question for you, a serious question. If you were planning a dinner party with some of your closest friends, would you want Jesus to come and join you? Would you extend an invitation for him to come to your dinner party? There's my Liam. Now think about it for a minute. If you and your closest friends gathered at your house, would you want Jesus to be there? I mean... What do you think Jesus would say to you and your friends? If you said yes, you're probably thinking Jesus would tell you some great stories about God, right? Maybe regale you with some kind of incredible revelation about what's getting ready to happen. Maybe in your life, maybe in the world. Maybe you think, hey, this would be great. If Jesus is going to be at my house, then maybe it'll get me a little better in with Big Dad up top, right? Maybe I'll get that better seat. Surely, he would pat me on the back and say, good and faithful Christian, I'm proud of you. You're doing everything right. Keep up the good work. Right? I mean, that's what Jesus would say if he came to your house, right? Because, I mean, you're good Christians. You go to church. He'd praise you. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know what the Pharisee thought, but one of them thought it'd be a good idea to have Jesus over for dinner with some of his Pharisee and scribe friends. So Jesus is invited to dinner with these folks. And guess what? You know, this Jesus guy, he doesn't follow the rules. He doesn't follow tradition. He doesn't do the things that you're supposed to do. And I've often heard it said in many articles that Jesus Christ wouldn't last one year in our churches before we'd run him out on a rail. Why? Because Jesus didn't follow the rules. Jesus didn't appreciate all the traditions. Jesus didn't do things the way people thought he should do things. Jesus took the way people did things and turned them upside down. We wouldn't want Jesus in our church. Especially if he made us change everything. What didn't he do here? Jesus didn't wash his hands before the beginning of the meal. Uh, and, and it's not that his hands weren't dirty. That, that wasn't the issue at all. Hand washing was a ceremony. And if you came to the Seder meal last year, you know that that's a part of the worship. That's part of their having a meal. We did that during the Seder service last year. We ceremoniously washed our hands. And we'll be doing that again this year during our Seder meal. I invite you to be there. And they went to great lengths. This hand washing was even was a very big deal. It took about one and a half eggshells of water. First, you would hold your hands like this and they would pour the water and it would need to drip down until it got to your wrists. 
And you would turn your hands like this and they'd pour the water and it had to drip off all of your fingers. And you had to do that before you ate. You had to do that between courses and you had to do that at the end of the meal. That was the ceremony that you had to do. And they're trying to figure out why this Jesus isn't doing our ritual. Why is he not observing this? When asked about it, Jesus got angry. I often think he was just waiting for that chance to be able to speak. And he did. He became uncharacteristically angry. Jesus went off on the dinner host. You Pharisees are all alike. Can't you hear him? You take great care of washing the outside for appearance sake, but in the meantime, the inside remains filthy. And it was then that Jesus began a list of warnings to them. Scripture calls them woes. Basically, Jesus is telling them they've done a good job of looking religious. They've put on a good show for everybody, but they're not acting religious. First three are, def- are directed directly at the Pharisees. He said, Woe to you Pharisees! You give a tenth of everything, wheat, barley, mint, but you fail to love God and you fail to treat people with justice. Shame on you. Basically he's saying, so you tithe, great. But you don't love your neighbor. Jesus says, woe to you Pharisees, as you always take the best seats in the synagogue. In the very front row you sit there. Not so you can see, but so you can be seen. Shame on you. You make sure you have the best. And you don't care for the poor. You're not looking out for others. Your focus is all about you. And woe to you Pharisees for you. Tell people that if they touch a gravestone, even by accident, they'll be unclean. And yet, you Pharisees are walking gravestones. Your faith is dead and you don't even know it. You want to tell everyone else how to be religious. You want to be the gatekeepers. But you yourselves are ignoring the basic commands of what it means to be in the faith. Mark shared a, the Gospel of Mark, he shares a, the same idea of Jesus confronting the Pharisees. He said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. Yet they devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished severely. Basically, Jesus is talking about it's easy to look religious on the outside. That's all they seem to care about. Was looking religious. Having that appearance. Having people look at them and think, oh look, those are religious people. I want to be like them. Jesus is saying God doesn't care about all that. God cares about the heart. And I know where your hearts are. Of course, he addressed the Pharisees there, and there were some scribes at the dinner party as well. And one of the scribes stands up and says, Teacher, when you talk like this, you hurt our feelings. Would we say, Jesus, what you're saying hurts our feelings? Wonder how Jesus would reply. And I don't know about you, but after what Jesus just said to the Pharisees, if I was there, I'd be keeping my head down and my mouth shut. Right? I was thinking, I don't know why he's thinking this is going to get better. But he opens his mouth, and the first thing Jesus says, after he says, you hurt my feelings, he says, well, woe to you too! You're thinking you're better? You're worried about me hurting your feelings? Woe to you, scribes. You make rules for others to follow. And then you invent ways for you yourselves to escape them. You place the burdens on others and not on yourselves. Woe to you, scribes, because the only prophets you like are dead prophets. When living prophets come to you, you turn them away. You don't want to listen. You're only looking back not ahead at what God can do. 
You want it your way and you're not willing to listen to open yourselves up to where God is calling you. Woe to you, scribes, for you've made Scripture a book of riddles that only confuse and confound the people. Shame on you. You burden people down with rules and regulations that drive them away from the faith. You have to do worship and observe the faith your way or it's wrong. Are you still sure you want Jesus at your dinner party? Basically, the common thread in all these woes is the fact that the scribes and the Pharisees wanted to keep their hands on the religious gate. They wanted to be the gatekeepers on how to be faithful, on what it meant to be a faithful Jew in this case. They wanted to determine how the rules were to be kept. They wanted to decide who broke the rules and who didn't. They wanted to preserve the church in a way that it was for them, the way they liked it to be, the way that they had crafted it and wanted it to be. They used their own lives as yardsticks to measure themselves against others. That's why Jesus is so brutal on His attack on them. There is one comforting fact in this story. It's that Jesus was not denouncing the scribes and Pharisees, or let's say the religious people. He was condemning their religious piety. That's what he was after. He was denouncing their legalism. He was criticizing their pride. Especially when it was religious pride. You know, when we look at this text for today and what it means to us, if we met a modern day Pharisee on the street, what do you think they would look like? What would the Pharisees and scribes of today be like? Who are they? I wonder if they could look like us. Isn't it we who want to determine what the religious rules ought to be? What it's like to be faithful? What it means to be a church member? Isn't it our individual Christian experience now that's the yardstick we use to measure religious people? Do we take time to look and see what the Bible says, if it's right and proper to do? Or do we just make decisions based on our own religiosity? On our own sense of what is or isn't acceptable as a Christian? Do we get caught up in maintaining our traditions and forget our calling? I think you have Baptist Pharisees, Methodist Pharisees, and Disciple of Christ Pharisees happens when ever people get so convinced that their way is the right way and dismiss others as being wrong. When the focus becomes inward and the heart for the lost becomes hardened. When our desire for making it about my wants and needs outweighs taking care of neighbor. When that happens, we become the Pharisee. The question that we need to be asking is, how do we care for people who do not readily fit into our congregation structure? How do we care for those who might not look like us or act like us? How do we reach out to them? Jesus proved on the cross once and for all that love is more important than rules and traditions. Jesus proclaimed that people are more important than programs. Compassion is more important than protocol. But the Pharisees of every age disagree. We get so caught up in the fine print, we lose our focus on the big picture. We take our focus away from mission, the Great Commission, and instead we focus on the minutia. It's the question always comes down to, what are you more passionate about? Church tradition or church mission? Pharisees got so caught up in tradition, following the rules, doing everything just right, that they forgot why they were doing all that. They made themselves up to be shining examples of following the rules, but forgot about having a heart for God. A heart for God's children, having the same passion and love that God has for everyone. Scolding the widow for working on the Sabbath to feed herself instead of remembering 
their responsibility to care for her. Jesus doesn't want people who look religious. He wants them to be religious. He wants followers who allow their hearts to be transformed by the Gospel. Because it's easy to look religious. Are we just giving our tithe and going to church to show that we're religious people? Or have our hearts truly been transformed? Jesus wants you to have a heart for people. For the least, the last, and the lost. To have a burning desire to be faithful to God and share the message of Christ's love with everyone around you from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Not just show them we are religious. Sociologist Anthony Campolo once described the greatest criticism he ever received while speaking in a church. Of course, it's easy to come into a church and be a guest speaker. Standing before a well-dressed religious congregation, Campolo announced, tonight in West Africa, 6,000 people will die of starvation and you don't give a damn. And he didn't use that word, he used something much stronger. The people gasped. But Campolo continued right on. And right now, you're more concerned about the fact that I said damn in your pulpit than you are about 6,000 people that died. The point he was trying to make is the hearers didn't get it. They didn't get it. They resented being scolded. Their hearts were hardened and they responded with ridicule and criticism and rejection. Pharisees and the scribes didn't get it. The reading ended today with Jesus saying, when in Jesus left that place, the scribes and Pharisees began to criticize Him bitterly and ask Him questions about many things, trying to lay traps for Him to catch Him saying the wrong thing. They were challenged by this Jesus. That's not acceptable. That's who the Pharisees and the scribes were. It's my way or else. And we know where that thinking led them. You know, once a heart is turned to stone, it's difficult for it to soften again. Sometimes it takes humility to turn a heart around. Sometimes it even takes death. What will it take to soften your heart to love like Jesus? Too often, probably more than we'd like to admit, our hearts have turned to stone. We're more concerned about having things our way than loving like Jesus did. Too often, like the Pharisees, we want it the way we want it. Whatever it takes for you, I encourage you to lay your heart at the foot of the cross today and let the softening process begin. What would Jesus say to you? Whatever it might be, it begins by admitting to Him that we want our heart changed. We want our hearts to be like His. Placing our rock at the foot of the cross today acknowledges our desire for Christ to create in us a new heart, one that burns with the same passion as His does. We'll invite you to bring those stones forward and put them at the cross during our invitation hymn. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank You for Your Word. And if we're honest, sometimes we do struggle. It's easy for us in the world we live in to get caught up in having things the way we want them to be. And it's so easy to let our heart get turned more to focusing on ourselves than focusing on those around us. I'm trying to figure out how to reach out to the, to the poor in our community that need hope. To those in our community that are struggling and need love and acceptance to those that are lost, 
and need to be found to those that are living in darkness and need a light. Our world is hurting. And you have called us and equipped us to be the hands and feet of Christ. Ones that have been granted the same power that Christ had. We just have to use it. We have to be careful of not falling into the trap of being the Pharisees and the scribes. But following the path of the one who laid down his life for us. Or just help us to be mindful of our Savior. He taught us how to live. He taught us how to love. He taught us what it means to be faithful. Not just on the outside, but in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.